Before we, uh, before we look into the Word, uh, let me just make this announcement. Uh, you can check your calendars. I hope that uh, when we meet together on uh, May 29, if you don't have anything else and you have a desire, uh, we want to invite you to stay here. We're going to have a luncheon and some fellowship because... Uh, the May 29, that will be the last of our lessons until the fall. And so I'd like us all to have a little fellowship dinner. If you can make it, you're certainly invited. Uh, also now, when we come to the study of God's Word, I remind you of that principle of Bible study that's indispensable, and that's total reliance on God's Holy Spirit. The Bible was written by the Lord. It must be interpreted by the Lord. It's a spiritual book communicated to spiritual people. And we need to have the heart to listen to the Lord. And uh, He's promised He would meet with us. Let me give you a couple of verses from Psalm 36. Uh, they're just expressions lifted from verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 9 but uh, putting them together here's what it says it says thy faithfulness reaches to the skies all right get that picture in your mind and then it says uh, thy judgments are a great deep so you got his faithfulness reaching to the sky and what the Lord allows and does is a great mystery. That's a great deep. So you got His faithfulness and His judgments, and they're both beyond human understanding. And then verse 9 says, With thee is the fountain of life. In thy light we see light. And so He gives us light in order that we might have more light. I'll pick that up in another connection toward the end of the study. But with that in mind, let's pray together, give our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you again for gathering us. Thank you for the truth that in your light we see light. And so we pray that you might work in us, that we might be walking in the light. That we might give you an unhindered right of way in everything. And we give this little meditation to thee and ask you to guide us and protect your people from anything I might say that's not from you. And we thank you for that and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, um, <clears throat> we're looking together at Joshua chapter 7 and 8. And we've been doing that now for three or four weeks. Uh, for the past couple of sessions, we've been focusing on the loss at Ai. Seven and eight deal with the loss and the subsequent victory at Ai. And uh, we've been looking at the loss and the result of that loss. Now, the result of their loss, there are human things, but the big reason they lost, Joshua 7, verse 12. Therefore the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies. They've become a curse. I will not be with you anymore. That's why they lost. When God stops fighting for you, you lose. When God stops fighting for me, I lose. Now, in our world, especially these days, there's a lot of bad news. Bad news in the world, sometimes bad news in the church, sometimes bad news in the family, sometimes bad news in our life. But the worst news that ever reached a human ear that anyone could hear is that the Lord is not fighting for you anymore, that you're on your own. And uh, that's where they were. <clears throat> the important thing to remember is 
that all defeat comes when God withdraws himself. There are occasions from our life, pride and covetousness and, and uh, anger and that other thing that can cause defeat. But the ultimate is that God withdraws his hand. He puts the sword back in the sheath. Israel did not lose because they had too few soldiers. When you first read it, it might seem that way. But you remember Gideon's 300 and uh, 32,000 were defeated. And you remember uh, Abraham's 318 men and uh, Genesis 14 and he defeated four armies and four kings. Uh, I like what Jonathan told his servant in 1 Samuel 14, 6. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. The Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Uh, isn't that a wonderful verse? The Lord, it doesn't matter how many. Uh, you remember in Judges 15, Samson killed a thousand with a jawbone. So they didn't lose because they had too few. Uh, nothing is so small in your life or in my life. There's no AI so small that we can handle it. You can't handle anything. I can't handle anything. And the faster the Lord teaches us that, uh, the better it's going to be. Now the results, this is review, the results of God not fighting for you are threefold. Uh, Judges, uh, Joshua 5, 7... <laughs> Let me put my teeth back in, right? <laughs> Joshua chapter 7, verse 5. The men of Ai struck down 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim, struck them down on the de descent. The first outworking when God doesn't fight for you is defeat. This is the only defeat. 36 men. Imagine, they went against... They went against 31 kings and 31 armies in a seven-year war, and they only lost 36 men in the whole seven years. And so the first result is that we're going to be defeated. And then we're going to be demoralized. Chapter 7, verse 5 again. The hearts of the people melted, became as water. Once you start fighting your own battles, you'll see how easy it is to become afraid and to be demoralized. Joshua 7, 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord till evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. And then the last illustration is we're losers. <laughs> You can't win. When you fight for yourself, you're going to lose. That's illustrated by Achan. Chapter 7, verse 24. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And so, if you fight your own battles, you're going to get defeated. If you fight your own battles, you're going to be filled with fear. You're going to be demoralized. If you fight your own battle, you're going to be a loser. Uh, Achan not only didn't get to enjoy what he stole, he also lost everything else. And uh, he's just a loser. No wonder they call that place the Valley of Achor. Joshua 7, 25. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor. The word Achor just means trouble. Uh, when you start fighting your own battles, you better believe it. You're going to end up in trouble. You're going to end up in the Valley of Trouble. And not only that valley, but there's another valley. Judges 2 describes it, verse 4 and 5. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words, and the words there in the context, I'm not fighting for you anymore. When the Lord spoke those words, the people lifted their voices and wept, 
And they named that place Bochim. Bochim means weeping. Bochim means tears. The valley of tears. When God's not fighting for you, you're going to be defeated. You're going to be demoralized. You're going to lose. You're going to end up in the valley of trouble. You're going to end up in the valley of tears. Now, I want to continue this morning what we began last time. And I began to show you the grace of God in the defeat at Ai. We didn't come to the victory yet. We'll do that, Lord willing, next week. But this is the grace of God in the defeat at Ai. And I started showing you how God demonstrated His grace Underneath this all-inclusive truth, all things are redemptive. Because the Lord is a God of grace, everything in your life, everything in my life is redemptive. That means that God will use positive, negative for His redemptive purposes because He's sovereign. Now last time we demonstrated it uh, by Hosea chapter 2, 14 and 15. There was a valley of trouble, a valley of Achor, but God turned it around. Hosea 2, 14, Behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, speak kindly to her. I'll give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. Isn't that amazing that God can turn the valley of trouble into a door of hope? And there she'll sing as in the days of her youth, the days when she came from the land of Egypt. You don't need to be saved twice. You're saved once. And that's all you ever need. I remember when I lost the sense of God's presence after I became saved. I hitchhiked all the way out to Hartford, Connecticut, tried to find the school where I first accepted Christ, and I had the janitor get me in there, and I found the same seat that I sat in when I received the Lord, and I asked the Lord to save me again, because I thought I needed to be saved. I don't need to be saved more than one time. You're not born again, 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 again. You're just born again. But, God reenacts your salvation. Every time he restores you, it's just like getting saved all over again. David calls it, Rejoy, uh, uh, jo- give me again, return the joy of my salvation. And so, uh, by undeserved grace, he'll take that valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, he'll turn it into a door of hope. And not only a door of hope, but Isaiah mentions the valley of trouble. Uh, In Isaiah 65, 10, Sharon will be a pasture for flocks. The valley of Achor, a resting place for herds, for my people who seek me. When you start seeking God out of the valley of trouble, it becomes a valley of rest. So that's one illustration of the grace of God in the defeat at AI. He takes the valley of trouble, turns it into a door of hope, and into a place of rest. What about the valley of tears? The valley of Bochim? Does he transform that as well? And the answer is yes. Psalm 84 and verse 5 and 7. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose hearts are the highway to Zion. Passing through the valley of Becca. Becca is just singular for Bochum. They make it a spring. The early rain covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. Because of your rebellion and sin and backsliding, you might end up in a valley of tears. But God will use that and turn it into a a valley of springs so that others can come from your tears, from your trouble, and they can find a door of hope, and they can find a resting place, and they can find springs of living water. Uh, As I said last week, as I look back, it didn't happen when I was going through it. 
But now as I look back, I can't praise God enough for the many ways he's used my mess-ups. I'm not encouraging you to mess up. I'm not encouraging you to take your eyes off the Lord. But there's life after that. After the valley of trouble, after the valley of tears. Uh, once you put your eyes back on the Lord, immediately he draws his sword and begins to fight for you again. Immediately he draws his sword and begins to fight for me again. It's never more complicated than that. Don't listen to all these people who try to make the Christian life hard and complicated. It's simple. As you receive Christ, that was simple. You came as a nobody and said, Lord Jesus, help. As you receive Christ, so walk in Him. The whole Christian life is nothing more than continually receiving Christ. It's that easy. Putting your eyes on the Lord. So trouble becomes hope, a door of hope, and a place of rest, and tears become springs of living water. Uh, I told you, as though, although there were 31 different kings and armies, uh, they only lost 36 men. But though they fought 31 kings and armies, there are three strategic battles for the land of Palestine. There was the land, the battle for central Palestine, which is illustrated by Jericho. Then there's the, the battle for southern Palestine, and there's the battle for northern Palestine. The reason I'm bringing that up now is I want you to think about this. Three strategic battles to win Palestine. How many of those three were after the battle of Ai? And the answer is two of them, two of them. And the reason I'm calling attention to this is sometimes we think once we mess up and get into trouble and get into tears, we think it's all over. No, the greatest victory follows the valley of tears. Uh, look at Jonah. What was his greatest victory? And the answer is after his repentance. Uh, Peter denied the Lord. When was his greatest ministry? See, it was after that. It was after that. And so I'm just trying to encourage you. Keep your eyes on the Lord. And you're going to fall. I'm going to fall. We're going to mess up. But the Lord is able to deal with that. God is a God of redemption. And the fact is, after a fall, you're not put on a shelf. I was taught that. When I was a young Christian, if I sinned, I'm going on a shelf. And if I miss God's best, I'm stuck with his second best. God has no second best, and God has no shelf. Uh, when you're restored, you're restored not only to what you were, but you're restored to higher usefulness. You're restored to greater usefulness. And the reason is because you've been humbled by that fall. And so... You're going to have less confidence in the flesh than ever. And so I just wanted to show you, that's part of the grace. Now, I want to continue this morning showing you illustrations of God's grace in the fall of uh, Ai. Uh, well, I mean, the defeat, the fall of Israel at Ai. Uh, <clears throat> I want to introduce a topic. I'm, I, I'm not going to develop this. I'll just suggest the principle and let the Holy Spirit apply it. I told you Joshua is the Hebrew word for the Greek word Jesus. And when we introduced the book, I called attention to the fact that only Jesus can take me into Jesus. So Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus. But although it's true that Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus, he's also a human being. He's also a man subject to failure. Uh, he's trusting in the Lord. <clears throat> and we're going to see as we go through Joshua that Joshua is learning along the way. Uh, Joshua is not only a picture of Christ, but he's also a picture of Christ in you. Christ in me. And today, 
uh, those of us who have begun to learn the secret of the Lord, union with Christ, we're the ones that are privileged to lead God's people into the land which is Jesus, into the land which is rest. And I don't need to tell you that you're not perfect, and you don't need to tell me I'm not. Uh, it doesn't take long to realize who we are. And like Joshua, we got to learn along the way. Uh, in the Bible, there are no clear-cut sins mentioned of Joseph, for example. No clear-cut sins mentioned about Nehemiah. No clear-cut sins mentioned about Daniel. They're picturing something else. We can't get into that now. Uh, but Joshua, he made some huge mistakes along the way. Even though he's picturing Christ, he also pictures us leading others. So Christ in us. And so I want to look at a couple of those mistakes, not to be critical of Joshua, but to magnify the God who is a God of grace. Uh, I don't want you to think as we study Joshua, the great military leader, that he had it all together. He didn't. And he has to learn a lot. And the AI story shows about three or four blunders that Joshua made. And I'd like to point them out to show you how God corrected that. Let me mention them first and then maybe develop them just a little bit. It was a mistake for Joshua to send out the spies. Joshua 7-2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, said to them, go up, spy out the land. And so the men went and spied out the land. And then after the spies came back, they gave some bad counsel. And it was a mistake for Joshua to listen to that counsel. Joshua 7, verse 3. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there. They are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. He also made a mistake in his prayer life, and I want to call attention to that. Uh, he didn't pray when he should have, and he prayed when he shouldn't have. Uh, Joshua 7, 10, and 11, the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it you've fallen on your face? Israel have sinned. They've transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. This is not a time to pray. You've got to deal with sin. And so it's an interesting thing. And then Joshua also made a large mistake by forgetting a lesson that God had already taught him. You know, sometimes we say, God has taught me to trust him. Don't count on it, because <laughs> you're going to probably forget that, and you're going to have to learn it again. And uh, I never say anymore, God taught me this, because I have to, it's like that man, you know, with the, the, the blind man. He touched him, he saw men as trees walking, and then God touched him again. And we're going to always need that second touch. And no matter how clearly we think we see, we see men as trees walking. And we're going to see men as trees walking even till we get to heaven. And the fact is, when you first arrive in heaven, you're going to say, finally I see. Yeah, hang in there. A million years in heaven, you'll say, wow, when I arrived, I thought I saw. But I never saw you as beautiful as you are now. Ten million years later, your eyes will be open ten million years wider, and your mouth ten million years wider in amazement. You say, I knew you were wonderful, but I never knew that you were like this. All through the ages of eternity. And so I just want to call attention to Joshua having to relearn a lesson that God began to teach him 40 years before. And we'll look at that. So let me uh, mention those lessons. Uh, first of all, the lesson of the spies. 
as far as the Bible record goes, there are four big spy passages. There's a couple of little ones. David sent out the spies and doing some reconnaissance and so on. But five, uh, four big spy passages. One you remember, Numbers 13 and 14. They sent out spies when they were in the wilderness to spy out the land. Let me read those verses, beginning at verse 17, Numbers 13. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said, Go up there into the Negev. Go up into the hill country. See what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they're few or many. How's the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. They not only sent out spies in the wilderness, but remember the battle of Jericho. Chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 1. Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shechem, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. The third spy story is here in Ai, chapter 7, verse 2. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up, spy out the land. So the men went and spied out Ai. The fourth spy story uh, we looked at when we were in the book of Judges together. Chapter 18, when Dan was not satisfied with the will of God. Remember the tribe of Dan? And so they wanted to spy out a land that would be more comfortable for them. Judges 18, 2. So the men of Dan sent from their family five men of their whole number, valiant men from Zorah and Eshtal, to spy out the land and search it out. Those are the five, rather the four, large spy stories. The wilderness, Jericho, Ai, and the tribe of Dan. And each of those stories ended in failure. All four spy stories. Even Jericho, although God turned the curse to a blessing in terms of Rahab. Now, before I show you the essential evil of spying out the land, let me begin with objections against spying being wrong. Uh, for example, Numbers 13. The Lord said to Moses, Send out for yourself men that they may spy out the land of Canaan. And some read that and say, well, now, wait a minute. How can spying be wrong if the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, send out spies? Well, let me give you the background. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 21. Now, Moses is speaking. Then all of you approached me and said, let us send men before us that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took twelve of your men, one man from each tribe. You see, in Deuteronomy 1, we see who initiated. And it wasn't God's idea, it was man's idea. They came to Moses and said, we need to spy out the land. It's like when Israel wanted a visible king. You remember that? 1 Samuel 8. All the elders of Israel gathered together and said to Samuel at Ramah, they said, Behold, you've grown old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. And you remember the response. Chapter 8, verse 6. The thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you. They've not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. 
And then in chapter 8, verse 22, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice. Appoint them a king. It wasn't God's will. The men wanted it. We demand a king. And God said, all right, let them have one. And so it looks like God's directing it, but he's allowing it. He's not directing it. Psalm 106, 15. He gave them their request, but sent a wasting disease among them. I like the King James. It says, he gave them their request and sent leanness to their soul. In that connection, be careful what you pray. God may let you have it. And it could be leanness to your soul. Now, a second argument some people say God commanded it. No, he allowed it. A second argument was, uh, how could it be wrong when Rahab the spy, uh, I mean the, uh, the woman in uh, Jericho, uh, became saved because of the spy? Listen to Hebrews 11:31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. And so... Some would say, because she got saved, that, that must have been God's will to send out those spies. Because God is wise and loving, He can do what He says in Deuteronomy 23, 5. The Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loves you. Now, you've heard that expression, the curse is turned to a blessing. I wonder if you knew it was in the Bible. That's a Bible word. And God turns the curse into a blessing, and that doesn't mean that God engineered the curse. He just turns it around. That's what I call redemptive, that everything is redemptive. Uh, God can use man's blunders for his purposes. Remember Joseph's brother's? You meant evil. God meant good. You sold me. God sent me, he said. Uh, the cross is an illustration of the curse turned to a blessing. And I believe the salvation of Rahab is not condoning spying, but it's glorifying the God of grace who can turn that curse to a blessing. Let me tell you right up front what is the essential evil of that picture sending out spies? And the answer is sight. Living by sight. It's the opposite of faith. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. The way I re remember it is the word spies rhymes with eyes. And so uh, it's just living by sight. Now, why is it wrong to send the spies into the land of Canaan? And the answer is given in, in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 6. First I'll read it from the American Standard and then from the King James. On that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land I had selected for them. In the New American, in the margin, they have a note for selected for them. And it's called spied. Spied out. The land flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all land. Here's the King James. In that day, I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them flowing with milk and honey. See, they didn't need to send spies because God had already spied out the land. He's the one that had already spied out the land. And they should have taken it by faith. You realize this, when those spies came back, they did not tell them one thing that God had not already told them. They already knew everything. The spies did nothing except end up in the valley of trouble and the valley of tears. The second lesson that Joshua needed is closely connected with that of spy. He needed to learn not to trust sight. That's first. 
But now Joshua 7, 3. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only two or three thousand men need to go up there to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there. They are few. And once again, we've discussed this, uh, this dependence on the flesh. We can handle the little thing. Can't handle Jericho. Those walls are too big. God's got to do that. But we can take care of AI. It's a little thing. Don't rely on worldly wisdom. When those spies, people living by sight, give you advice, I like to think of AI as AI, artificial intelligence. <laughs> Don't believe it. It's not true. Uh, worldly wisdom concludes two things. Uh, from verse 27 to 29 in Numbers 13, they told them, We went into the land where you sent us. It certainly does flow with milk and honey. This is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. Cities are fortified, very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek's living in the land of Negev. Hittites and Jebusites. Amorites living in the hill country. The Canaanites are living by the sea on the side of Jordan. And so they gave a report. Verse 23, or 32 rather. They gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out. The land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. The people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There we saw the Nephilim, sons of Anak, part of the Nephilim. We became like grasshoppers in our own sight. So were they, we in their sight. Worldly wisdom has one conclusion. It says, you can't do it. Give up. There's enemies out there. They're too strong. There's a lion in the street. But then the other side of worldly wisdom is what we read in Joshua 7, 3 and 4. You can do it. Go up. There are only a few. You can handle it. If you listen to worldly wisdom... Those who live by sight, you're going to learn two things. You can't do it. You can do it. And both are flesh. I can't do it. That's still me. I can do it. That's me. Humility is not low thoughts of yourself. Humility is no thoughts of yourself. Not low thoughts, but no thoughts. The counsel of man is always either... Give up or dig in. That's all worldly wisdom can offer. Uh, here's the reality. Christ in you can do it. Christ in you will do it. You can't. You can. But it's not you. It's Christ who lives in you. So Joshua needed to learn not to live by sight. And he needed to learn not to depend on the flesh, not his own, and not the flesh of those who <coughs> desire to give him counsel. There's a third lesson he had to learn. Let me set it up and uh, let the Holy Spirit apply it. Uh, there's a great emphasis on prayer in this story of AI. First, when did Joshua first learn what was wrong? in the battle of Ai? And the answer is, when he prayed. Listen to Joshua 7, 6 and 7. Joshua tore his clothes, fell on his earth, on the earth, on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. Both he and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over Jordan, only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? If only we'd been willing to dwell beyond Jordan. And that's when God told him, I'm not fighting for you anymore. Give me one second, please, to turn this tape over. God told him 
He wasn't fighting for him when he prayed. Did Joshua pray before he sent the spies to Ai? You see, the answer is he didn't pray. Did he pray when the spies brought back the report? You only need a handful. You only need a few. The answer is no. If God revealed the truth, I'm not fighting for you, when he prayed, does that imply if he had prayed earlier, he might have learned that truth a little earlier? You see, we usually blame the 36 dead soldiers on Achan. And we say, because of Achan's sin, 36 men died. But I wonder how much responsibility Joshua had as the military leader by not praying in advance. You see, those men would have still been alive if he had prayed when he should have prayed. Uh, in fact, did he even get the Lord's approval to go to Ai at all? See, he just took Jericho, and then he just said, keep marching, we're going to Ai. I wonder if he had prayed at the beginning if things would have been different. Uh, there's another illustration of Joshua's prayer, and it's in verse 10 and 11. The Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you've fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. You see, Joshua didn't pray when he should have. But now he's praying and God said, what are you doing praying? Get up. You shouldn't be praying now. It's not a time to pray. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, when somebody resists the Lord and asks for a king and God allows it, or asks for spies and God allows it, uh, we know then uh, we should have been praying and seeking the Lord. Uh, but sometimes it's God's will that we don't pray. Sometimes it's God's will that we don't pray. In that connection, I love uh, Genesis 18. Remember when Abraham was praying about Sodom? And God said, if there's 50 righteous, I'll spare. And then he prayed. He said, Lord, uh, how about 45? And God said, all right, 45. And then he said, Lord, don't get angry, but what if there's only 40 righteous? Will you spare them? And God said, okay, 40 righteous, I'll still spare them. And then he got real brave and he said, Lord, how about 30? <laughs> if there's 30 righteous? And God said, all right, if there's 30 righteous, I'll spare them. He said, please don't get angry. How about 20? And he said, all right, if there's 20 righteous, I'll spare them. And then he said, Lord, I know I'm dust and ashes. I don't deserve this. How about if there's 10 righteous? And God said, all right, if there's 10 righteous, I'll spare them. Why didn't he ask five righteous? You see, he knew when to stop praying. He knew when to stop praying. And there's a time to pray. And the Lord will show you, and there's a time not to pray. Remember Moses at the Red Sea? Exodus 14, 15. He had just given them this great lesson. Stand still, you'll see the salvation of the Lord. This is all a victorious message. I love the message. And then God said, verse 15, The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. It's not a time to pray. Tell them to go. It's time to act. Time to move. You got to know when to pray. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we got to know when not to pray. Samuel kept praying for Saul after Saul departed from the Lord. And finally God said in 1 Samuel 16, 1, How long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him from being king. Don't keep asking me to restore him. It's over. There's a time not to pray. Jeremiah 7, 16. As for you, he said to Jeremiah, do not pray for this people. Do not lift up a cry or prayer for them. Do not intercede with me. I do not hear you. There's a time to pray and a time not to pray, and Joshua needs to learn both. Uh, 1 John 5, 16, there is a sin leading to death. I do not say he should make request for this. And so there's a time not to pray. And that sin unto death very clearly is when someone takes a bold and willful stand against the Word of God. So I don't care what God says. I'm going to marry that person. I don't care his will. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this or that. 
that person, don't pray for them. They got to pray for themselves, confess, get right with God. But there's a sin not leading to death. If somebody is impatient or angry or blows up or, or, and they still have their heart on the Lord. They're just living a life. Pray for them and God will give them life. But if somebody takes a willful, bold stand against God, don't pray for them. You say, well, how do I know when to pray? How do I know when not to pray? Well, if prayer is trust, then the answer is Psalm 62.8. Unfortunately, I didn't put that on the sheet. <laughs> Psalm 62.8. Uh, when prayer is trust, the answer is easy. It says, trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart before Him. It's always right to pour out your heart. Uh, Lillian and I, sometimes, we don't see exactly the same on prayer. I pray in a very general way. Thy will be done. Glorify thy name. If it be thy will, let this pass. I'm big and she's specific. Like they're driving down the highway, give them uh, traveling mercies and, and all that. And sometimes I say, why are you praying that? And she said, you pray your way. I'll pray my way. <laughs> it's always right to pour out your heart. And she's just pouring out her heart. And so she prays specifically. I pray generally. That's my heart. And so it's always right to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord at all times. Pour out your heart before Him. That's Psalm 62, 8. There's another prayer. And though I'm going to jump ahead to another story. It's not the AI story. But it's Joshua learning about prayer. One of the most amazing in the Bible. Joshua 10, 14. Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, O moon in the valley of Ajalon. There was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And that's when the sun stood still. We'll get into that when we get to that passage. But the point is, Joshua had to learn when, when to pray, when not to pray, and then how to pray the prayer of faith, which he prayed at that time. And God responded to that. So, God is a God of grace. And he's teaching Joshua not to live by sight, teaching Joshua not to listen to worldly counsel, teaching Joshua when to pray, when not to pray, when to uh, pray by faith. Uh, let me give another example. Uh, this is one of the greatest examples of Joshua needing to learn. Remember I told you sometime God teaches you something and then you forget it? Well, he has to reteach it. At the beginning of the wandering, in fact, the first mention of Joshua in the Bible, he was a military leader. And it, this is the Battle of Rephidim. Now, I'm not going to take time to to read the story. I'll tell you the story and you'll recall the story. Remember Moses was on a hill and he held his staff. His, you know what a staff is. Let me tell you what it is. It's a dead stick. That's what a staff is. It's a dead stick. And he held his staff, his dead stick, toward God in heaven. And Joshua was down the valley fighting. He had an army and he's fighting. And every time the stick pointed toward God in heaven, Joshua would win in the valley. And every time the stick came down toward man and earth, then Joshua would start losing. And I can picture Joshua saying, Come on, keep that thing pointed up. I'm losing down here. And it was a great lesson for Joshua. Chapter 17 of Exodus, verse 11, came about when Moses held his hand up. Israel prevailed. When he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. And you remember, it was a long day, and God provided godly men to help Moses prop his direction in the direction of dependence on God. Usually when we call for volunteers, it's volunteers to fight in the valley. God wants volunteers to help people prop up their dependence on the Lord. Praise God for anybody who helps you point your dead stick toward God in heaven. Uh, 
may God increase their tribe. We need that. Anyway, uh, the message is simple. Trust the Lord, you win. Stop trusting and you lose. Well, after that little story, God gave a strange command. Exodus 17, 14. And the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua. This is something Joshua's going to have to remember. Recite it to Joshua. Now, uh, that was 40 years before. God taught him that. He was the one in the valley. He was there. He should have said, I learned to trust the Lord. I learned when the dead sticks pointing toward God in heaven, you win. When it's on the earth, you lose. I learned that lesson. Now, come back 40 years later. Battle of Ai. Even though it's written down, he forgot. Evidently, they didn't read it enough and recite it enough. So God did something very wonderful at the battle of Ai. Look at chapter 8, verse 18. And the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the javelin that's in your hand toward Ai, and I will give it into your hand. Now here's an amazing thing. Now Joshua is the one with the dead stick. And he said, Hold it out toward Ai. And so... As you read, and we'll get into that victory, as you read the victory at Ai, Joshua, the military leader, was not allowed to fight in the battle of Ai. Instead, he had to hold that javelin out. And then you say, how long did he hold it out? Look at verse 26. Joshua did not withdraw his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until they had uttered, utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. All day long, he wouldn't fight. He just had to relearn a lesson that he had learned many years before. Write it down. Recite it to Joshua. So God not only turns the valley of trouble into a door of hope and a resting place, a valley of tears into a valley of springs. He's also willing to reteach us things over and over. He's so patient. How many times we have to relearn the same thing? You say, I used to know that. I used to do that. I remember when I trusted the Lord. We're a forgetful people. You see, that's why you break bread. This do in remembrance of me. Because even such a thing as what he did on Calvary, we're apt to forget. Peter gave a reason in chapter 1 why people don't grow in Christ. you got to read the, uh, first, uh, Second Peter, rather. Chapter 1, verse 9. He who lacks these qualities, and that is the qualities of growth, is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sin. He forgot that he got saved. He forgot what he did at the cross. I want to show quickly two more illustrations of God's grace in the defeat, and then, Lord willing, next week we'll look at the victory at Ai. So far we've seen God's grace in transforming the valley of trouble, transforming the valley of tears, uh, that the loss of Ai was the only loss, and they had won for the rest of the seven-year war. God, faithful to teach Joshua not to live by sight, not to trust the flesh, how to pray, when to pray, how to pray the prayer of faith, reteaching us things that we uh, have forgotten. The fifth evidence of His grace is the gradual revelation of Achan's heart. I want you to think about that. Chapter 7, 14. In the morning you'll come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. You know, the nation at this time was organized into four classes tribes, 
and they had a prince over each of the tribes. Families, and they had the heads of each of the families. Households, and they had the father of the household, and then individuals. Uh, you're going to see in this story, and when we divide the land, the truth of Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap. Its every decision is from the Lord. There were three ways God revealed his will in the Old Testament. One was by revelation. Sometime it was a dream or a vision or an audible voice, but sometime he just gave his will. But the other two ways, one was the, called the Urim and Thummim, and uh, the priests alone were in charge of the Urim and Thummim. I'll tell you in a minute exactly what that is. <laughs> You're dreaming. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> and the lot. The lot. Now, in those days, uh, the Urim and Thummim, the words mean light. Somehow God gave light. Some people think the, the stones on the breastplate, light, light. Okay. <laughs> Some think the stones on the breastplate, when it was God's will, would flicker and light up or something like that. I don't know. The point is, don't confuse yourself with, how did that lot work? It worked. That's the point. The every decisions of the Lord. Uh, later, we're going to see in chapter 14, I won't read that, you can glance at it, but when they divided up the territories, the land, they did it by lot. Uh, you remember, that lot, finding God's will by the lot, continued till just before Pentecost. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, 26, they're going to replace Judas as an apostle, and they drew lots for them. And the lot fell to Matthias, he was added to the eleven apostles. Whether it was by stone, some think, colored stone, put, put stones in the bag, and one white stone, if the white one's picked, then you know God's will. Uh, or by drawing straws, or by throwing dice, or by blinking lights. Don't worry about all of that. The point is, that's how they found out God's will. And what the lot did, it took it out of the hands of man. That's the point of the lot. We're going to trust the Lord, put it in his hands to decide. Somebody sinned. How did they find out who it was? And the answer is, whatever it means, they found out by the lots. Joshua 7:16. Joshua rose early in the morning, brought Israel near by tribes, the tribe of Judah was taken. So the lot fell on Judah. All right, you other tribes, go home. Judah, stay here. Verse 17, he brought the family of Judah near. The family of the Zerites were taken. All right, now the other family can go home. Then he brought near the family of the Zerophites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. All right, now we're into Achan's house, Zabdi. And finally, he brought the household near man by man, Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabzi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now, wouldn't you think as the noose was tightening, as it was getting closer and closer to Achan as the guilty one, that he would come forth and say, all right, all right, it's enough, it's me, I'm the one that did it. Now, I don't know if he thought finally he could get away with it. He could escape, but he didn't say anything, little by little. Now remember, God knows who it is. This lot is not so God can find out who the sinner is. God knows who the sinner is. But he's trying to, he's accomplishing something by doing this gradually. And I suppose it must have been a suspense for everybody, uh, you know, like when the disciples, when Jesus said at the table, somebody's going to betray me. And he's, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? You, get, you start to feel a little bit uh, guilty. When the spotlight fell on Achan, Joshua said, verse 19, Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. Give praise to him. Tell me what you've done. Do not hide it from me. How is the grace of God illustrated 
by this gradual revealing of Achan. And again, it's not for God. It's for Achan. And I believe God was gradually calling Achan to repentance. He's given him a chance to repent. He could have confessed. Now, did he repent at the end? Uh, verse 20 looks like he may have. Achan answered and said, Truly I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. But that expression, I have sinned, does that mean I have repented? No. Not necessarily so. It's interesting, if you go through the Bible, you will find that expression, I have sinned, ten times in the Bible. Five times, it's genuine. And five times, it's just, I admit it. <laughs> I have sinned. Uh, let me just, for interest, if you're interested in that, in Exodus 10, Pharaoh said, I have sinned. In Numbers 22, Balaam said, I have sinned. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul said, I have sinned. In Matthew 27, Judas said, I have sinned. And now Achan, chapter 7, verse 20. Uh, Achan admitted his sin. In other words, he got caught. He got caught. He did not repent, as far as I can see. Uh, the evidence, if the evidence didn't close in on him, I don't think he ever would have admitted his sin. This is the policy you might note of politicians. Uh, they will not admit it. And then finally they get caught. And then they, in pride, say, well, I did it. I'm going to take responsibility. You know, I'm the one that did it. And, and so they admit it. Uh, what sin did he confess or admit? He didn't confess the sin that caused all the problem. Stealing the spoils from God. Taking glory from God. The sin he confessed... Uh, in verse 21 of chapter 7, uh, he said, I saw among the spoil beautiful mantle from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. I coveted them and took them. His sin that he admitted was covetousness, not stealing God's glory. It's just covetousness. Now that's a terrible sin. It's the first sin that was publicly dealt with in the new land. And it's the first sin publicly dealt with in the new church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. It's the same sin. In this connection, because of that admitting, uh, Psalm 119.36, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn my eyes away from vanity. Revive me in your way. King James says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not unto covetousness. Uh, I have one more that I'm given, but I won't give it now because the time is... So we'll pick up here one last illustration of His grace and then next week we'll move into His victory because I want to develop the next one a little more. I don't want to take your time. Uh, once again, I'll remind you, uh, at the, the last week that we'll gather together is May 29, and if you can arrange your schedule, and if you desire, we'd love to have you, we'll invite you for lunch, and we'll just stay here, and you can order whatever you like, and we'll just have sort of a fellowship together. All right, any comments or questions? Yes. God taught me that I need to learn to trust in Him. He taught you? He's going to keep <laughs> teaching going you. back to what you said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amen. Learn to trust in Him. Yeah, we're, we're all learners. We're, to we're, we're just toddlers. Nobody. You know, when you think God is infinite, yeah. we're up to our ankles in the Lord. We Nobody. Somebody says, I know the Lord. <laughs> Nobody knows him. We're all starting to know him. We're all pilgrims on the same path. I need the Christ you have. You need the Christ I have.
With that in mind, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Not what we think it might mean, but all You know it means. Will You work that in our heart? Thank You for great grace that You can transform these terrible valleys into something good, that You can teach us and reteach us the same lesson over and over. You're so faithful. You're so patient. Thank You for all the grace You show and for gradually working on our conscience and always calling us to repentance. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you.